Uh, it's not uh, because you don't know anything about this. It's because I want to expand what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to go as quickly as I can. Um, I guess we'll start here. When I left last time, uh, you had homework. And it was to take the passage, take the example I've given you, and uh, make your own uh, outline of observation or what happened. Sort of a historical outline. Did anybody get that done? Okay, you did. Great. So grab me a cordless mic, please. What, how are we supposed to grade it? Oh, he did it. She raised her hand like, I did it, I did it. And then I said, we're going to read it. And she's like, he did it. <laughs> Does that thing work? It's okay. Good. We'll, we'll just do a couple so we can get on with what we have tonight. We don't, be, we don't have to be here all night, but is that thing working? Okay. Let's see. Oh, you got to turn it on back there? Oh, isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Oh, that's my vibrato. That's scary lovely. I can be way more scary. Am I on yet? Oh. Testing, testing, can you hear me? Good. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take yours, if you have it done, and, uh, and or your Bible, and I want you to kind of listen to what they came up with. Now, let's remember something. We're not critiquing. We are working together, okay? This is not about so much right and wrong, though some of you will be wrong, okay? It's about learning um, to study. So, who's the reader? It's mm -hmm. <laughs> not much different. Zara, if they get out of line. Okay, I'm not exactly sure how to read this, but um, so Revelation 3.14, um, I said, you, John, write, number one, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, and then also um, write these things, saith the amen, um, the faithful witness, the true witness, the beginning of the creation. Um, and then I have some cross-reference verses for those things. Let's just stay right in the text. Okay. Revelation 3.15, I, the Amen, know, number one, thy, the Laodicean church, works, um, that thou art neither cold nor hot, and I, the Amen, would that thou wert cold or hot. Um, so then, Revelation 3.16, I, the Amen, will spew... Um, spew thee out of my mouth because thou art lukewarm and neither caught hot nor cold. Okay. Are you, you done? Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Um, Revelation 317, because thou sayest, one, I am rich and I am increased with goods. I have need of nothing. Um, thou knowest not. Thou art wretched. Thou art miserable. Thou art poor. Thou art blind. Thou art naked. Um, Revelation 3.18, I counsel thee, because of verse 3.17, to buy of me um, gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. I counsel thee to anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Okay. Do you want me to keep going? Keep going. Okay. Um, Revelation 3.19. Um, as many as I love, I rebuke, and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous, and, um, and therefore repent. Revelation 3.20. You behold, I stand at the door, I knock. If any man hear my voice, open the door, I will come into him. I will sup with him and he with me. I have no idea if I'm doing this even close to whatever. Okay. Revelation 3.21, I will grant to sit with me in my throne to him that overcometh, even as I also overcame, I am set down with my father in his throne. Revelation 3.22, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
Who, uh, who else got it done and maybe had a different approach? Okay, Scarlett. Dun, dun, dun. Well, I'm not, I wasn't quite sure what the approach should be. So okay. I really struggled, so I just whipped it out. And I'm like, well, it's just so it's short. Okay. No um, excuses, no right or wrong, no worries. We're so just learning. Well, there's wrong, but we won't talk about it. So mine's very abbreviated. So to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, from God, the faithful and true witness. I know thy works, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. Because you are rich and don't have need, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Uh, li I'm not reading the numbers, I'm just. Oh, that's fine. Listen to my counsel to be, I can't read it. Listen to my counsel to be rich. Um, close yourself in virtue, open your eyes to your spiritual need. I am telling you because I love you. Repent. I am here with the answers, accept me. Those that overcome will set with the Father, listen and heed. So, okay. so, uh, so far what we're getting kind of is um, uh, almost a sentence diagramming level. It's okay. We'll talk a little bit later. We did that also. David, did you have a... Did uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to get through it quickly. Main points and sub points. Yeah, but still. Uh, well, maybe we, you can record that and we'll listen to it now. <laughs> go, go as quickly as you can. We have a little bit of work to do tonight. Well, on the first part, where it starts at the beginning and the, the thought there, this is a continuation of a list that started elsewhere, literally at the beginning of chapter 2. So it's important to place all of that together with not just, you know, in context, I guess is where I'm going with that. Mm -hmm. So all of those letters... Uh, are really important. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, it says, unto the angel, the question here was, who's the angel? And the, this is described for us. John initially sees this in chapter 1. Seven golden candlesticks he sees in the midst, one like unto the Son of Man, and in his right hand seven stars. And it defines those St those stars uh, as being the angels of the seven churches. So who is the angel? Again, that was the question. Is the, <laughs> is the angel a, a celestial being or is the angel the messenger, which is actually the, the messenger being the translated word? Because these letters were written to the churches, they, somebody has to give the letter to the church. Okay. Uh, read the letter to the church. So that's undoubtedly going to be the, a pastor or someone in leadership reading to the church. Okay. Uh, is there an angel involved in this? Perhaps. I can't say there's not. But a lot of what is written in this in Revelation period is, all, is a lot of pictures. Describing a lot of word pictures, a lot of metaphor. One thing or the other. So the, and then the next verse, these things saith the amen. It's already established this. that this is from Christ. He's the one that's writing this. In, in this, he establishes himself as the amen, which would be the creator of all things, ruler of heaven and earth. Uh, and really he that will have the final say and judgment, hence amen. The true and faithful witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works. This is, he declares he knows the works. Uh, he, knows, he knows more than the, the Sunday man. He knows the, he knows the Monday through Saturday man. Mm -hmm. He knows what they do. He knows what their heart. I, Lord, I, the Lord, search the reins, or search the heart. I try the reins. That's, he's establishing this fact. He knows uh, thy works, the works of the church and the individuals in the church. And not only this one, but again, this is all seven churches okay. that were listed in these letters. Uh, being neither hot, thou that, 
I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Uh, the, the, the thing out of this is there's no, as in the other churches, there's a condemnation or a commendation of their works. Something in, in what they're doing. This church doesn't have that. There is no commendation for anything that they're doing. Uh, really, this is a, a self-satisfied, self-satisfying church. They have everything they need, uh, and they've really, cold referring to the indifference to the things of God, spiritless, frigid, uh, and hot would be eager or animated, if you will, on fire for God is probably the term that we often hear uh, these days. But the, the frustration with the Lord here is the self-satisfied state of this church. They okay. have need of nothing, uh, whether that was a claim uh, literally by the pastor, possible, or if it's just the spiritual condition of the church. Uh, but because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Here is the, a temporal picture of their spiritual condition. Hot water had a specific use, cold water had its purpose, but lukewarm water was of no quality. I want to get a, at least one more uh, in. I'm, I'm kind of looking for uh, what I probably didn't teach you very well. Mike, what do you have? Well, I kind of approached it a little bit differently. So I, I okay. like factoids in my stuff, right? So I kind of went back through the different things in regards to start, starting off with and unto the angel uh, of the church of Laodiceans, right? So who was the angel in... Uh, went through a bunch of commentaries and also went through the Nelson's book of Bible maps and charts was actually found a PDF online. So I didn't have to buy the book. So, and then it referenced to Archippus who was actually a saint in the church of Laodicea 20 some odd Mm -hmm. years prior to this probably being written. And that, that may have been some reference to Archippus in regards to the angel of church of Laodicea. Okay. Um, and then the faithful, and it goes, these things saith the amen, the faithful and a true witness. And, and who are those faithful and true witnesses are those that didn't bow to Domitian as, as a god, right? Yeah. Oh, no. Um, so, so The faithful and true witness is Jesus. So let, right. me, let me back up here. And um, we're, we are in the observation phase right now. What we haven't gotten past or to is the conclusion of the observation phase. So does anybody have the sample outline that I gave you the last time we met together on Mm -hmm. this? And all we're talking about is approach. So everything that you all are saying is good. But remember this, we're not really yet. The only thing we're studying is for facts, right, during this stage. And we're letting the Bible, so we don't need something to tell us. We're, We're only using those things to help us understand the very words of the Bible, okay? So, um, let me see. I'm gonna gonna have you, a lot lot of good work there, Mike. Thank you very much. I'm gonna have you, if you have it, just kind of uh, uh, go through the first couple of main points and sub points. Now, now listen to what we're looking for. This is the point that we're getting to, what we're trying to get to here, and and maybe I didn't bring you here well, but is to where we're now saying this is what happened and we're simply outlining what happened. So we're not trying to do a diagram. We did that a few weeks ago. I think that was hard and maybe we need to do some more work there. But but this is where we're saying here's what happened. We're telling the story as it was written there. Okay? We're not searching for meaning necessarily. We're simply saying this is what Jesus did. This is what they did. This is what Jesus did. Okay? Uh, all the other things, like Mike, great work, and David as well, all of you, um, they're the supporting facts that take us to this is what happened, okay? What we're doing is we're laying all the pieces out and trying to put it back together so we have a picture by way of outline of what is said to them to whom in that church. So go ahead, Sherry. So one, Jesus establishes himself as one with the authority and ability to declare this message to the Laodicean church. Okay. And the authority of the message is based on the messenger. 3.14. One, amen. The final word can't be overturned. Two, faithful and true witness, character and knowledge of Jesus. Three, the beginning of the creation of God 
eternal God, authority and ability. Number two, Jesus gives his estimation of the condition and the viability of the church in Laodicea, 3, 15 through 17. One, they are a working church, 315a. Two, their works are not enough to make them a viable church or to earn the merit of God, 13, 3, 15b through 16. Three, their estimation of themselves is completely wrong and has made them useless to God because of their spiritual condition, 317. Okay, that's, that's good. So uh, remember what we're doing, we're learning here. So what's the difference between what she read and what, what you read, let's say? Anything at all? Right, right. And that's an important part of observation as we talked about before. So getting those words sort of torn apart so we can see the flow of thought and, and, um, and know what words we need to learn more about. Angel was hit much on. There's a question in the observation questions we did several weeks ago. And um, uh, so, th so that's the process. When we get done, we need to be able to say, this is what happened there. So all the pieces, and, and I mean, good, good work, but all the pieces have to come together to say, this is what happened, okay? It's as if we were uh, writing the author's outline, I think is how I said it last time. If, the, if we were sitting down with the, uh, you know, uh, with the knowledge that you've gained from pulling the pieces apart, now we're putting them together and saying, well, this is what Jesus did. So uh, the first thing I think that Sherry read was, you know, Jesus establishes his ability and authority to, to what's the word I use there? I don't remember. <clears throat> okay, to declare it. So Jesus comes with a message that's hard. We're going to get to the hard part. Um, but he comes with a message that is like pow in their face, right? And he says, now make sure you understand this. What I'm going to say what I'm going to say is, because I can say it, I have the authority and the ability. I'm the amen. I'm the final word. I'm the faithful and true witness. I don't stretch things. I don't hyperbolize. I don't do any of that. I'm the faithful and true witness, right? I'm the beginning of the creation of God, okay? I'm eternal and without beginning, without end. And so he's establishing, if you will, his credentials. All of this, if you remember in the context sheet I give you, gave you, eh, that was sort of hippie, or uh, redneck, something, I don't know, but uh, well, that I gave you. Uh, it takes us back, really, to chapter 1, where John identifies Jesus in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Does everybody understand what I'm, what I'm saying here? Any questions? Because we're there, we're on the road there, uh, but we're trying to get to this, you know, based upon all of that observation, this is what happens there. You're right in your sworn statement, if you will, of, of not all the facts, but this is what happened. I saw the guy run out of the street. I heard gunshots. He had a gun in his hand. The lady was dead. Here's, here's the observation. That guy shot that lady. It's based on all the pieces, right? But it's, the, it's what happened. Now here's why that it matters that we get to that point in observation. Because the next thing we're going to do, and I'm just going to kind of get started on it. You've got a handout tonight. We'll probably just roll most of it over to next week. But um, the next thing we have to do is take this outline of what happened and translate that, if you will, or interpret that to eternal truth. Okay? So the happened outlines, so the observation together, which gives us a, an outline of what's just being said and done in that passage. We're not really looking at meaning to any degree during this observation phase. We're simply saying, this is what's there, okay? That we take and turn up into eternal truth. Does that make sense to everybody? So I, I, I'm, I'm being cautious here because I'm very, I'm very excited about the work that you've done, okay? I think we're uh, generally kind of a half a step away, though. I think that would be a right description of just saying, you know, in very direct terms, this is what happened right there. N not reporting every piece, but saying, Jesus did this, here's how he did it. Jesus did this, here's how he did it, okay? And what we're doing is establishing well, what some call like the big muscle movements, okay? Of the event or the letter, the communication that took place, okay? So let's stop right there, see if you have any questions, because I've obviously left you a little bit behind, but yes, sir? So I, 
I, I, I think that was further back. Um, I'm sorry. If it did, that's uh, on me. Yeah, so, so uh, that was the one before this. So the diagram, that homework, A+. Plus. This homework, B, B, solid B. Is that, I'm trying to make you happy. <laughs> Which one? No, well, this was the last one. So this was the homework we're working on. Right. That's the happened. Okay, so uh, if you're confused, that's, uh, that's on me. Let me step back a bit. We started this talking about observation. We used an example of a text outline. I don't have all the handouts with me, but I, I, gave, you, uh, I gave you a text outline of this, a textual sort of diagram, all highlighted in yellow. Does anybody remember that? And at that point, I, that's when we were to look at that and kind of make our own or work off of that. Um, I know Rhonda finished that. We didn't have her report it. So then the next time we met together, we talked about creating the happened outline. And we talked about it by saying things like, <clears throat> the lesson was on the, the value of the word. Why does this matter? Because of how God sees the word and uses the word in our life. And that homework was to write more of an outline than a thing. So uh, on me, you know, I'm sorry that there was confusion, but um, that's where I was uh, hoping that we'd be at is at the outline level uh, tonight, not the diagram level. So maybe, maybe we missed out there. So um, I don't want to waste our time, and I certainly don't want to be confusing. It's not something I major in most of the time. Um, but uh, we've got to get to the point, and the exercise was to get us to the point where we end up with something like what I gave you by example last time, that is, as I said, that sort of, this is what happened, okay? Major points, supporting points, and we start looking for meaning when we have that. Now, let me explain to you why. So everything like that Mike just said is true, okay? Uh, there was stuff going on with Domitian that was horrific. Um, there were uh, people that uh, asserted themselves in all kinds of ways, but those are true historical facts. The question of whether or not they had anything to do with Laodicea to any degree, and more importantly, this, this text is about Jesus' assessment of Laodicea as a church and what they're producing, okay? So David said, you know, this is a work in church, and God knows their works, and yes, he does. So truly, Jesus establishes himself in verse one or 14, that I have the authority and ability to do this, okay? So then he says, now let me tell you, based on that authority and ability, what I think of you as a church. And here's what he essentially says, you don't matter. You work like a dog, but nothing you do matters. Why would he say that? Someone tell me. Because they don't need him. So they were real busy, but no glory to God, okay? Okay? And the reason why, and so he makes that assessment using the illustration of water. I think we talked about that when we went through context. Cold water has a function, right? Hot water, David mentioned it, has a, a function and performs it. Lukewarm water, nobody's excited about that. If I had three uh, lines next week, this one's got cold spring water in it. This one's got uh, ever hot uh, uh, hot bath water, and this one's got lukewarm salt water. Take whichever you want. Take as much as you want. How many of you think I'd have most of the lukewarm salt water left when we were done? Right, because you'd be like, what do I want that for? So that's his assessment. So when he does that, what, what I'm trying to get you to see, and, and um, we'll get into this week. We won't spend much more time tonight. We'll roll, as I said, most of it over. What I'm trying to get you to see is that that we're in the process of taking this text apart, whether by diagram or uh, some other method of observation. The only one we've talked about is diagramming, and you're getting that. I can hear it in what you're saying. And now we're putting it back together as a report. This is what happened. This is point one, if you will. Jesus did this. Here's how he did it. 
subpoint A, B, and C in an outline format. Then Jesus did this, right? And here's how he did it, right? Or here's how he said it and why he did it. Jesus, I mean, he says this, I'll spew you out of my mouth uh, because you're not, neither hot nor cold, I'll spew you out of my mouth. What's he say next? What's the very next word after that? Verse 16 or 17. Because, okay? So you get this? As we observe it, and I mean, you guys are doing that well, but all of those pieces say, well, Jesus can, has the ability, and he does, and he makes this very harsh assessment because of what he has the ability to see, okay? And the harsh assessment is done because he says, I know your works. You know that uh, he knows both what we do and why we do it and how we do it, right? And, and I know your works. It's not that you're lazy. It's just that none of your works matter. And the reason they don't matter is, is because you say you don't need anything. And don't acknowledge that you are, uh, you know, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Someone give me a Bible verse that would teach the same thing in less words. Okay, for by grace are you saved through faith? It, it, it would say that at the salvation level, absolutely. How about this one? Without me, you can do nothing. How many of you have ever read that and went like, yes, I can. I mean, I can fix cars. I can, I can argue with my wife. I can feed my dog. I don't know. But the point is, is that nothing matters for the glory of God. Nothing is nothing, okay? So all the work in the world being done supposedly for God, and I believe the intentions are right, but not done in dependence upon him by faith in honest dependence that doesn't amount to anything. Why? Why doesn't God get glory out of that, Linda? That's okay. Yeah, so, so all the work in the world, uh, church buses, board meetings, um, I don't know, you know, uh, outreach, even a Sunday school class, a sermon, a service like this, a beautiful choir, all these great works done without complete dependence upon God. Pure faith. Knowing that we can't do it without Him. It doesn't produce anything for the Lord. No glory. Why? Why would He get glory for what He doesn't do? And you know, what he doesn't do when we try to do these religious things without him, that's what he's saying to Laodicea. What you don't do undermines all of the busyness. Let me give you a phrase. I've probably said it to you before. Never, ever forget this phrase. As a Christian, it is not do to be. It is always be to do. This is ultimately the fault of Laodicea is that they are doing to try to become something. And they're doing it, as we talked about in context, they have great wealth, they have great industry, they have great textiles, they have great eye salve, they have all of those things, and Jesus touches on all of them in saying, here's your, here's your difficulty. You're doing all these things without me. If I disappeared from the universe today, nothing would change in your church. Did anybody just get a little lump in their throat when I said that? We should get a huge lump in our throat, shouldn't we? Because, uh, you know, it, it is true that, that churches sometimes have church without any regard that Jesus, while I know he's everywhere present and I know all of those things, he's not the sinner and he's not doing the work. He's an observer at their church. Can I say this, church? Uh, let's not ever allow Jesus to be an observer here. He needs to be the motor, the power, the purpose, the motive of all that we do. And we need him to do anything that matters. I mean, honestly, I could stand up and talk for an hour and a half and say nothing. And you go, I know you do it all the time. But. And it wouldn't matter. In fact, could I tell you this? I could preach a perfectly homiletically correct message. Every point of doctrine perfect. And people walk away from that who need that 
completely unchanged, absent the power of God that only comes when I'm completely dependent upon him. I hope you don't think that your pastor stands up and goes, I got this. I don't got this. I don't want this. I want him to do the work. Because it is never do to be. It is always who I am, be to do. So doing doesn't produce who I am, Jesus does. And so when he transforms me, now my work is him through me. It is be to do. Has everybody got that? So the church at Laodicea, they said, uh, we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. So Jesus, we're doing this for you. Sit down and watch us. <laughs> Aren't you glad we never do that? See, that's, that's, that's the caution for us ultimately. But in this observation phase, we're saying, Jesus said this to them. And Jesus said this to them. Okay? We're, we're not striving after meaning. We really haven't talked about meaning hardly at all tonight and this whole time. I know you're dying to get there, and I appreciate that. I, I love the zeal. I love the, the digging. It's all good. Okay? So, um, oh, goodness gracious. Whoever's putting D cells instead of triple A's in that clock up there needs to quit it, okay? <laughs> that thing is running faster than I'll get out. But. <laughs> so uh, I apologize for the confusion, and it's, it's on me, not on you. Um, and we'll, we'll straighten all that out. But does everybody understand what I'm getting at tonight? Do you have questions just about this, where we're trying to get to in the observation phase? This is the outcome of observation. And I want to say this to you. It's not more critical. The observation phase is not more critical. But the observation phase is the hardest work you do in the work of Bible study. Okay? Because the opposite of that is looking at a text and going, well, I think it means this. And we talked about that early on, didn't we? About that being subjective and not objective. And not letting the word develop. So the observation phase, where we tear it apart and bring it back together so we can say this is what happened, that allows us then to go and say this is what always happens, which is where we're headed next, okay? But I want to make sure that we got this, and I'm a little leery of that right now. N not because of you, because of me, but yes, Will? So, verse 17 is actually the lukewarm state that the church is in. <clears throat> Yeah, and they would still be doing what they're doing in verse 15. I know thy works, okay? So again, this wasn't a lazy or indifferent church. This was a church that had a lot of programs, no doubt, a lot of stuff going on. Now, you know, there are preachers that I know who say, see, we should never have programs in a church. How many of you agree with that? Of course we should have programs in a church. In fact, there are some things we need to add as a church, right? Right? So that's not what it's saying. It's not saying program bad. It's saying program without me is a problem. And how do we keep him in it, Lori? How do we keep him in the center? Yeah, how do we keep him doing the work? How do we keep him, yes, in the center? You know, is it possible that we could talk a lot about him and still not be depending upon him? I agree 100%. I guess my question goes deeper in that purposing and practicing, all right? Uh, so Daniel and the three Hebrew boys purposed in their heart not to defile themselves with the king's meat. And then they did what? Yeah, they in fact separated themselves from it, right? So, you know, the Laodiceans say, we, we don't, we don't need you. You got us. You got the like, you got the pick of the litter when you got us. I mean, we are the, I'm gonna get old here. We are the cat's meow. I mean, we are the, we are the, we are the golden apple, right? In a, in a tray of silver. We're, woo -hoo, we're all that in a bag of chips. I don't know, I can't. Because we're, we've got it all. We're rich, we're, we're mighty, we're intelligent, we're industrious, and we're doing something for God that God himself might not be able to do. 
because that's what they thought of themselves according to Jesus. Now, how many of you think that Jesus' assessment of them was right? And why do you think it was right? Because he's always right. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. But he establishes his credentials in every one of these letters based upon what they know him to be. Read any of the letters, and he begins with saying, Thus saith thee, I speak to you as in the role. And he's establishing his ability and his, his authority. And then he, he lays the hammer down on these poor people. I don't mean poor like they didn't deserve it, quote unquote. I mean poor like they didn't expect it. I think that preaching ought to be this all the time. I think that we ought to come and be challenged um, by the word of God, not by the preacher, but by God as the word goes forward. So who's got more questions? I don't want to just talk the night away. We're already... Why did they first call them Christians at Antioch? Why did they first call them Christians at Antioch? Well, I'll say two things about that, Gene. One is it's not at all related to Revelation chapter 3. <laughs> but I love you. I love you like my own brother. And the reason is, is because they were living completely dependent on and therefore really in the total walk, if you will. They demonstrated. They saw Jesus in them because they were so dependent upon them. It still has nothing to do with Revelation chapter 3, though. Other questions about this? I have one question. Okay. Yeah, they're, uh, they're on Amazon.com. Uh, no. <laughs> they're not either. Stop it. Whitney's got them on her computer. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, look, I know this has been hard and it's been start and stop, but uh, I want to get this nailed down. And if we have to step back a step to do it, I want to get it. This is, look at, look at tonight's handout. We need to close. But if you look at tonight's handout, we have to get the observation part down so that we can get to the actual truth, eternal truth. And here's why, just point number one, because, and we'll look at it in depth next week, but we have no access to the abundant life without a clear understanding of the Word of God that we can renew our mind on. So, so hear me, church, this is my, my passion for you, at least in part. That if we don't get this part down, will always be bouncing off the life that we desire with Christ. We'll always be doing and saying, does it matter? Or doing and saying, how come other people have a different life than I do? I can't account for them. Here's what I know. That when we walk in truth, we walk in Christ. When we walk in dependence upon that, dependent obedience to Christ through the truth. We walk in Christ. And then our works produce His glory. And they produce fruit right? And that's when we begin to say, wow, wow. And, the, you know, we can't ever get there. A lot of misinterpretation of Scripture comes because we don't get to the happened part, okay? And so we never get to the, this is what God did. Therefore, how do we get to the eternal truth from there? And I want you to get to the eternal truth. That's really what you're digging after right now, is you're, you're digging after meaning in the, in the process of observation. And I get it because I do it all the time and have to often step back uh, when I'm studying, when I recognize it. But I don't want you digging for meaning. We'll do that like soon. I want us to get the clear understanding of exactly what happened, who said what to whom, not in the form of a, a, a diagram. If you still need that to get there, that's great, okay? But I want you to get to where you can say, point one, if I'm writing this book and I make my notes ahead of time, right, through inspiration, point one is Jesus establishes his authority and ability to make this ass assessment of the church. Does everybody get that? And it's there in verse number 14. Point two, right, Jesus makes the assessment that the church there uh, is doing lots of things, but none of it matters for his glory, after you get up from praying and praying that God would never let that be us, you would understand that, right? That, 
that they, what he saw in them is a lot of stuff that didn't matter. Point three, they thought that they mattered. Now that's more applicational, but they thought that they were doing a lot of good things. They didn't learn this be to do, not do to be. Uh, and, uh, and they thought that they were really mattered. And he said, let me tell you why you don't, because you don't need me. You don't have me. You're not working in dependence and walking in dependence on me. David said it. God doesn't just see our work at church, amen. He sees the work of our walk. And all of it has to be dependent upon him. But here in particular, the ministries of the church being done without being dependent upon him. Okay, and so he makes a pretty rough assessment, doesn't he? And then he says this. I love you. Please come back to me. And in fact, just to throw one more rock at traditional things, I'm standing outside the door of your lives in your church wanting to come in. He's already their Savior, the church in Laodicea. I'm wanting to come in and be the head, heart, reason, and center that drives your life and your church's life. Because just because you've received me doesn't mean that I'm running your life and that you're dependent upon me. Does it, Jed? you get it and that's what he says to them I want in I want into your church I want to be in the place I belong for your good and my glory please repent repent of what repent of what what's what is he asking to repent of David your works without him him. a Christless church in the name of Christ that's what happened does everybody see that or got questions we're running out of time here Please don't hesitate. I, 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 want, I want to clarify whatever was left on the table. But So, does everybody understand where we're at here? Linda, are you, are you with me here? Okay. Doug, are you with me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so, sorry. No, you don't have to be sorry. I'm sorry. So, this time kind of we just got to say truth. Yes. Yeah, verses happened. So remember the process of inductive study. Observation, interpretation, application. We defined them about three handouts ago as the way Don Sanukian does in his book, which I think is helpful. Happened is observation. Happens is eternal truth. And happening is application, okay? So this will end up, you don't have to do it um, because I want to go through the lesson first, but... What we're aiming at is to get the happen, happened done so we can then learn how to get that to eternal. So, so, look, we have to take, Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, I have the authority to do this. What's that mean to everyone else? Is that, is, you know, what's the sort of eternal thing? What's the thing that, that is always that way out of that? I'm not asking, I'm just trying to give an example. Because that's where we get to in the happens outline. Okay, this is the eternal truth. When we when we go, we'll go through the lesson. Don't try to do the outline. Let's go through the lesson. Uh, I promise you, it'll be more clear than the last one obviously was. But um, and and then you'll understand exactly, I think, how to get to eternal truth. Okay, and uh, and then we'll we'll take that challenge on. But just on the observation, good question, Lori. I mean, are we are we is, are we kind of having a meeting of the minds here? Are we? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Or are you leaving with more questions? Right, Absolutely. Sorry. The, the sentence diagram part of it, mm-hmm. is that part of what happened? Yes. That, okay. Yes. So there's like two pieces to that. There's the break it all down and then put it all back together. Yeah, so there's the process of discovering. Okay. And then there's the uh, uh, accumulating of conclusion. Not conclusion on truth. Okay. Conclusion on history. Okay. okay? And that's, you know, that's why we, we did about four weeks on um, observation. Again, I obviously didn't hit the ball out of the park on that, but we'll hit it out of the park next time. But, um, but that's the whole point is observation doesn't just happen, right? Observation requires us to do the hard work of study. And to, to do some things. Remember we sat here one night and took all those observation questions? And I've given them to you several times, right? 
so that you can, you can look at them and understand how the, how the flow of the thought was. And we, we talked about um, narrative outlines, you know, outlining the thought, and now that all comes to the conclusion of this is what happens in this text historically. What happened there is what happened there, okay? So I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> you okay? Okay. Any, anybody else? I mean, like, I can't believe it. Spend all this time on a preacher, and you're still messed up. I know, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Anybody else got a question? It's already like 8.30. Yes? So I would like to see you take a stab at it. Okay? And uh, if you have the outline from last week, or the last session, last week, the last session was like three weeks ago, I'm sorry, but if you have the outline from that where I give you an example, it's, I mean, the example's pretty close to where I think you'll end up, but um, if you don't have it, then get it, and we'll, we'll get it to you. Whitney can print them off right away. And um, because I'd like to see you take a stab at taking all of the good work you're doing and putting it into that outline so you can say, I know what happened in that text so that we can then find eternal truth. Okay? Everybody got that? Not the one in this week's, but the one from two weeks ago. Yeah, so, yes. I uh, went through the handouts on my computer today just to be completely honest and make you think poorly of me. Um, I went like, okay, hold on. I just have them named like observation. Observation 2 helps for observation. So I went through and wrote, wrote in the file name number 1, <laughs> number 2. You're on number five tonight, okay? It's number four that you need to find. Uh, <laughs> that was not very helpful, was it, Jeff? Uh, but if you, if you don't have it, uh, Whitney will uh, print it out for you. And um, so I'd like to see you take a stab at it. Yes? Is, is this from a, like a book that you have? So it's from pe uh, books, books, pieces of books, I mean, and some experience. Mm -hmm. The happen happens happening thing though it's not very uh, super in-depth explained, comes from a book called uh, An Invitation to Biblical Preaching by Donald Sanuccian. I think, Mike, maybe you picked up that book. Was that you I talked to about that? Or maybe that was art. That was art, okay. And there's the 12 steps and the 7 steps, something other that you had mentioned before. Oh, books? Exactly. Do you have them written down there? I was trying to... Oh. This is my thing. Okay. I, this is how I was trying to... Figure out. Yeah, so the 12 steps was... Uh, just a reference to a book, 12 Steps to Great Preaching. Mm -mm. It's a good book, but I don't think I want you to read it because you'll be like, what's this guy talking about? I know more than he does. Yeah, which I hope you do. <laughs> I hope you know far more than I do. Okay, any other? If, if you're not clear, then let's make sure we're clear on how we move forward. Whitney, are you Okay. All right. Matthew? All right. Mike? Yeah, I'm more clear now because my first argument was I thought this was as useful as algebra. So ah, this is far more useful than algebra. Yeah. But many algebra students don't recognize the value of algebra until they need it, but yes. <laughs> I'm not, I have no comment on that. It's not <laughs> biblical. <laughs> David, you clear? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. What's that? All right. Well, if you have questions, get a hold of me. All right. Um, I don't know exactly how I got you so mixed up, but we'll straighten her out. We have to get the happens done to get accurate interpretation. And I hope everybody understands why. And, and then we can continue to refine the how. Okay, We can never accurately, rightly divide the Word of God if we don't first diligently understand what was happening, what happened in that passage. Okay? 
All right, it's way late. Let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to dismiss you. Pray for these requests. Pray for one another. And um, men, I'm looking forward to this weekend. You don't have to bring your homework to the men's retreat. (laughs) (laughs) David, dismiss us in a word of prayer, sir.